So yeah, uh, good afternoon everyone. And uh, so uh, this is the outline of my talk. I will be introducing the transport equation of cosmic rays and uh, uh, show an application in the context of diffusive shock acceleration that you might have heard about mostly in the uh, longer fashion. But today, uh, oh, great. Okay, great, thank you, thank you. Okay, and the, then I will show a, an application in the context uh, of the of the wind bubble, and in particular, I will be uh, talking about the model uh, on which uh, Marcus and I worked on recently. Okay, so let's get started. First of all, le let me repeat probably uh, what cosmic rays are and why they are interesting for people studying neutrinos. So cosmic rays are relativistic particles of cosmic origin hitting the top of the atmosphere with the... I closed it, Marcus. <laughs> so. Okay, thanks. Uh, hitting the top of the atmosphere with a very high rate. And they are, as you can see here from the, the spectrum, they are dominated by hadrons, uh, namely protons. And uh, this is why uh, they are relevant for uh, high energy neutrinos. And indeed, hadronic interactions of cosmic rays is the leading production mechanism of high energy neutrinos, namely those in this energy band in the uh, in the overall neutrino spectrum that we observe. So uh, now that we know this, uh, how can we model cosmic rays in sources and in general? So the idea is uh, uh, we need the transport equation, which is um, based on uh, statistical uh, physics and is nothing but the um, uh, we, we have the phase-based density, which is the number of cosmic rays per unit volume and unit energy or momentum, depending uh, on which kind of study you want to perform, uh, if directional or simply energetic. And the transport equation is telling you how this phase-based density is evolving as a function of time, depending on all the different processes that can affect your cosmic ray population. For instance, the injection, which is the mechanism we will cover uh, in this uh, short talk, and the mechanism of the scape, uh, such as diffusion and advection, as well as uh, losses uh, like adiabatic or uh, radiative or catastrophic-like interactions. So let me spend, uh, spend some minutes telling you uh, the basic theory of, uh, uh, of cosmic rays, uh, mechanisms such as diffusion and advection and, and the others. So, the diffusion is the most peculiar behavior of cosmic ray in the uh, in space, and uh, we all know since our bachelor, I guess, that uh, cosmic rays, namely relative uh, charged particles, when they find a regular magnetic field, they gyrate around it, keeping constant the pitch angle. But the interstellar medium is a magnetized plasma, typically characterized by uh, wiggles in the magnetic field, which are known also as alpha waves. And uh, indeed, we have a certain degree of turbulence. And what happens when we have cosmic rays injected in a turbulent magnetic field? If their energy is low, and with low, I mean Larmo radius much smaller than the typical wavelength of this magnetic field wiggle, they see particles simply surf on top of the uh, regular plus uh, wave magnetic field. If their energy is way larger, uh, namely Larmor radius, way larger than the uh, wavelength of this wave, they integrate out in a gyration all different waves. While if the Larmor radius is resonating with the wavelength of the, of the magnetic field wiggle, what happens is that the pitch angle starts changing in time, and this is a resonant process. And uh, this microscopic phenomenon is realized at mac uh, macroscopic scale as a spatial diffusion, namely cosmic ray that starts moving along the magnetic field line will eventually start diffusing and might also come back on the same magnetic field line. So we parameterize this behavior with the, the, with the diffusion coefficient, which has the unity of length square per second uh, uh, per time. And you can imagine this behavior like a drop of ink in the water and a spread of this ink. This is how cosmic rays behave in a magnetized plasma. So in order to 
make you appreciate better the behavior, that is the motion of a cosmic ray particle in a low level of, of turbulence magnetic field. And this is the behavior when the magnetic field is highly turbulent. You see that from helicoidal, we get to a quasi Brownian motion. This is why we talk in terms of diffusion. And this is how you can estimate the diffusion time scale uh, in, a, in a box of size H uh, with a diffusion, given diffusion coefficient, which is energy dependent. So diffusion is not uh, the only process affecting particles. We have advection and adiabatic energy losses in just in a few words. We now we know that cosmic ray and somehow for a certain amount of time confined in magnetic, uh, let's uh, call them bubbles or magnetic, uh, magnetize them, uh, pieces of volume. And these pieces of volume might be advected away uh, in an outflow. And the, the typical advection time would be the size of the system divided by the advection speed. And uh, additionally, if the, this outflow has a given geometry, like expanding, uh, they would lose energy adiabatically, like a, a, a gas of relativistic particles. Eventually, we have energy losses. And uh, to our interest are the hadronic interaction that are responsible for the neutrino production. But I guess Walter said already enough about PP and P gamma. So I'm going to uh, fly on this. So this is how the cosmic ray uh, transport equation looks like. It's a second order partial differential equation, typically nonlinear, which is very hard to be solved. But luckily for us, we often can make several approximations, namely, Typically, astrophysical system evolves way slower than uh, relativistic particles, so we can drop the, um, the time derivative, as well as typical, there are no preferred directions, so we can make homogeneous and isotropic assumptions, so we can often forget about the uh, adiabatic term. And uh, when this can be done, the transport equation often reduces to the one's on model leaky box-like approximation, where you simple simply balance the injection term with escape, like diffusion and advection, and energy losses. OK, now uh, we move to, to the second topic, which is the application of this equation to uh, the DSA, namely diffusive shock acceleration. So first of all, what are we talking about? So for uh, diffusive shock acceleration is an acceleration mechanism that needs requires the presence of the shock. And shocks are very common in astrophysical environment. We just need a violent phenomenon, an explosion, a supersonic motion of a, a fluid. And this is the way we can develop shock. Then uh, the second ingredient needed for DSA to be realized is a plasma. But that comes for free because the interstellar medium is a magnetized plasma itself. Therefore, uh, Cosmic ray acceleration mechanism is perhaps the most common first order Fermi mechanism realized in nature. And this is why it's so popular. And uh, qualitatively, it works in, in the following way. So we have particles. Now we know why they are confined in the shock region, because diffusion is confining particles in a box. We just put a shock in between the box. And for a certain amount of time, they will, uh, they will spread in this box and bouncing from one side to the other of the shock. And, uh, uh, from longer book, we know that each cycle from the uh, cool, fast cool wind upstream to the downstream and back, they gain a fraction of energy proportional to the uh, shock speed. But now what I would like to do is to show you how we actually properly model diffusive shock acceleration. And uh, uh, I will do so showing how is a general calculation adopting the diffusive uh, the transport equation for DSA modeling. So here we have uh, the undisturbed upstream region with the fast full wind. Here the shocked wind that is low down by a factor of four. So we are assuming strong shock jump condition. And we are sitting here on the earth in, um, at minus infinity in this reference frame. So uh, let me also assume that uh, the system behaves stationarily and we can neglect for the moment energy losses at the acceleration. And the equation we are left with is the following, where we, we can recognize injection, uh, the advective term, the diffusive term, and the adiabatic term. So let me first mention uh, some boundary condition. So 
far upstream, namely on, on Earth, where we are, we assume that the flux and the density of cosmic rays is negligible compared to what is at the shock. This is reasonable. And this translates to assuming that F and the left del Z at minus infinity are both zero. Then we also assume that in the shocked environment due to a dominant effect of diffusion, the uh, phase space density is homogenized. And finally, we take the injection to be pre present at the shock location. Now, let me explain better this injection term. So, first of all, we have N1 times U1. This is the flux of particles, density times velocity. And uh, psi is simply an efficiency factor, which is telling us how many particles of this flux are actually injected in the DSA process. We have a normalization for the phase space density. And then we have a double delta uh, uh, product. The first one in uh, Z is telling us that only at the shock location, namely Z equals zero, we have the injection. And the second one is a delta in momentum, which is telling us that only particles with the minimum energy such that they can actually jump from one side of the other of the shock are actually injected. And this consists in taking a, an energy that is typically on the high energy tail of the thermal Maxwellian of the plasma. This is why this delta approximation works, because as you can see, this uh, function is steeply dropping. So, and what diffusive shock acceleration does is taking these particles in the high energy tail of the Maxwellian, and uh, from thermal, it transforms them to non-thermal. And uh, this phenomenon just sketched here with some lines on paint is actually uh, uh, observed and modeled by particle in-cell simulation by uh, a lot of researchers right now. And you see here from how a tail in the thermal Maxwellian from, uh, gets to a power low energy distribution. Okay, now how uh, we solve it technically. So we, we don't have to solve anything in the shock plasma because we assume the phase space density homogenized. We will just solve uh, the transport equation here at upstream infinity uh, and uh, up to the shock and integrating across the shock. So we first integrate the transport equation from minus infinity to z less than zero. So we are in the upstream region where q is negligible. So because it's a delta in space at z equals zero. And here the velocity is constant to u1. So also this term is zero. And then we are left uh, with the uh, uh, the uh, ad advective term and the diffusive term, which are evaluated between minus infinity and Z. But at minus infinity, they are zero by assumption because it's on Earth. And so we are left with this uh, simple, uh, simple equation, which is nothing but a flux conservation in the upstream region, which has uh, an exponential solution where uh, uh, Z, remember, is negative. So it's an exponential drop. And the lambda d is the typical length of drop of this exponential, which is a very important physical parameter known as the diffuse, diffusion length. So this is the, behavior, the radial behavior in the upstream region of the phase space density, while in the, in the downstream, we get constant uh, uh, function. So now we want the solution at the shock. We integrate from zero minus to zero plus, and uh, we just uh, notice that uh, the velocity term can be written as an heavy side theta and the derivative of an heavy side theta is the delta function. Therefore, this term will be relevant. The advective term is continuous, so it gives zero when integrating in an infinitely small layer, while the diffusive term uh, as a, uh, it's a total derivative, so we get only the downstream part because the upstream is zero by assumption. The uh, advective term reads like this. So it's the function evaluate uh, P times the left LP evaluated at zero. And we have this, which is the derivative of the velocity term. And finally, we have the injection term evaluated at zero. So we apply now to the equation we are left with. Uh, the flux conservation solution that we find in the upstream region. And this is the equation that we actually solve. So 
we now write this parameter s as three times u1 divided by u1 minus u2. So the, this equation can be easily rewritten in this way. And with a bit of algebra, we can recognize here a total derivative of, uh, of uh, the phase space density times the power law in momentum. And uh, we are left with this kind of equation, which, uh, which can be easily integrated and gives us and uh, give us a result uh, as a result a power law in momentum. So uh, here, uh, let me say some words on the solution. So uh, we are having some coefficients in front, and then a power law in momentum of index minus s. Well, while s, if we uh, if we take strong jump condition, is nothing but four. So this is why. Uh, uh, how diffusive shock acceleration gives a prediction of p2 minus 4, which on relativistic energy is nothing but the e2 minus 2 that we all know. But notice that p2 minus 2 at low energy is not e2 minus 2. Actually, the assumption of e2 minus 2 in the GV range is wrong. So everyone who does it, it's a mistake. Okay, now an observation we have uh, a problem uh, with this solution because if you integrate, if you want to compute the energy density of uh, cosmic rays accelerated at shocks and you don't, uh, uh, you extend up to infinity, you will get a logarithmic divergence uh, in the uh, calculation of the energy density. And this can be solved only when you, uh, when you have or when you impose a maximum energy. But it's not easy to find self-consistently a mathematical expression of the maximum energy. And actually, uh, the maximum energy is, can be obtained if we revise our um, boundary condition. For instance, we have two possibilities, whether our stationary assumptions was wrong or the size of the system is fine. For the wind bubble, which are the system I'm interested in, it's actually the second that I will, uh, I will take into consideration while for transient events like GRBs or so, or supernova remnant, typically it's a time dependence that matters. So how do we impose a, a, a finite size of the system? We simply assume that it exists a certain distance upstream uh, at which particles, once they reach this location, they freely escape. So instead of considering a boundary condition at infinity, we impose a, a, a free escape boundary. And when we do so, we see that the diffusion, the particles with, with energy such that the diffusion length is equal to this uh, Z star, this E star is nothing but the maximum energy. So, and this could be a possible exercise if you don't like the exercise that, that uh, they have been given to you. So you could actually try to solve again the, the transport equation that I, I just uh, presented, but now assuming a free escape boundary condition. And while doing so, you can derive that, uh, an, an expression, a mathematical expression of a high energy cutoff in the distribution function. Okay, so after this uh, long discussion on DSA, I'll, I'll be introducing the, uh, the astrophysical phenomenon on which we would like to apply it, which is the wind bubble. So wind bubbles or, or diverging flows are uh, observed everywhere in astrophysics, and they are nothing but cavities excavated in the interstellar medium by a compact constantly blowing source producing a fast wind that is expanding with large wide opening angle. These wind bubbles are characterized by this onion-like structure that I will describe in greater details from the next slide. But uh, from the moment, I would like just to, uh, to show you the main parameters of this system. And uh, we have uh, the terminal wind speed, which is the, the speed at which the wind is launched. We have the mass loss rate, namely, the mass injected uh, in form of uh, wind by the central engine. We have the external density and the age that sets the size of the system at each epoch. So now structure and evolution. Uh, let's assume that the source is starting blowing a constant wind of wind speed u1 at the time t0, 
And that lets assume also that this wind is supersonic, therefore we will develop a forward shock launched in the interstellar medium. And at the same time, the collision with external material will lead to the formation of a, of a reverse shock or wind termination shock, it has these two names, uh, which is geometrically oriented towards the central engine. Namely, here is the upstream and here is the downstream, while for the forward shock, it's the opposite, it's expanding in this direction. Here is the upstream and here is the downstream. And the external matter is accumulated immediately behind the uh, forward shock and is physically separated uh, by, from the wind by the contact discontinuity. So these two shocks uh, will expand with constant velocity at, in the so-called ejector dominated phase for a time T1 up uh, at which the mass swept up is co becomes comparable with the mass of the wind itself. And uh, when this happens, the system starts decelerating. And in order to understand why, it, it's very easy. It's just you can imagine yourself driving the car. If you eat mosquitoes on your car, nothing happens. But if you eat another car, you experience a deceleration. So uh, what happens to the shock is that they behave so similarly, like indicated, namely the wind termination shock decelerates faster than the forward shock during the deceleration phase. But while the forward shock is losing quickly acceleration efficiency, because it, what matters is the relative speed between the plasma and the shock, here, the, the wind speed is very high because this shock soon becomes stalled, basically stuck in the reference frame of the source, and the wind arrives with very high velocity against it while cooling adiabatically. So Mach number is expected to be quite high. So this is why in our model we assume that this is the upstream region, this is the downstream, and here we have the shock edamia medium layer, which is highly dense and providing a lot of target material. Okay, now some skills and power. So uh, I was mentioning that wind bubbles are observed everywhere in, a, in astrophysics. We have uh, massive stars, we have stellar clusters, which are collection of massive stars. We have starbursts, which in turn are collection of star clusters. And we have AGN driven winds, which are basically spherical winds launched by, uh, uh, by supermassive black holes. Typically people know blazers and AG and uh, or BLR, but this is the most typical feedback observed in uh, active galaxies, when namely a spherical expanding wind. So you can estimate the maximum energy in the same way I was telling you before. So I won't lose a lot of time here, but uh, what you can get uh, uh, here, I'm showing the energetic of the source as a and here the maximum energy. Here we have wolf Rayet stars, Yamma sister cluster, starburst galaxy, and AGN. And you can see that uh, since their power is increasing, also the maximum energy they can achieve increases. And they and this kind of wind bubbles could populate the different energy ranges of the uh, cosmic ray spectrum observed at Earth. So now I will quickly sketch uh, our model. So we assume spherical symmetry and we solve the transport equation in the exactly same way I discussed at the very beginning. So we integrate upstream, we integrate across the shock, we also integrate in the downstream. So, and uh, we assume injection only at the wind termination shock, we follow the transport and we assume a free escape boundary and we compute the escaping flux at the forward shock. And we self-consistently uh, consider PP inter interaction and pigamma interaction when there is a relevant photon field. And uh, we apply this equation in the context of AGN driven wind bubbles and uh, which are also known uh, when the when their speed is as high as a fraction sizable fraction of the speed of light as ultra fast outflows. This kind of wind are, have been observed in the x-rays like uh, iron uh, highly ionized iron light shifts. And uh, they are with wide opening angle, and uh, they are quite powerful. And uh, we we solve that that equation, the same transport equation I've discussed for the whole talk, and we get a nice solution. So here is the uh, radial distribution of particles uh, I already discussed, and here is the the spectrum of accelerating particles at the shock, which is flat, like DSA 
is predicting in E squared F of V. We get a maximum energy around EVs for uh, this kind of outflows and, uh, and uh, nothing. We, we basically suggest that this kind of object are EV accelerators, namely they could possibly populate the region of the highest energy of the cosmic ray spectrum. Uh, last but not least, uh, we can we are computing gamma rays and neutrinos. I don't. I already finished my time, but uh, there is a stacking analysis performed by the Fermilab collaboration. We applied our model to that, so our model is uh, able to predict fairly well the, the gamma ray luminosity as well as spectral behavior, and we self consistently calculate PP and P gamma neutrinos. And we see that well, uh, these sources could be neutrino emitters up to hundreds of PV. Okay, so this is my take home message. So I hope I convinced you that uh, diffusive shock acceleration is an evergreen over, over uh, everywhere realized in uh, astrophysical environment, that wind bubbles at all scales from star to galaxy to AGN to starburst are uh, promising site for diffusive shock acceleration, that we have multi-messenger radiation coming from these uh, objects, and that now you know that UFOs are not only aliens, but also uh, ultra-fast outflows in AGN, and they could possibly be EEV accelerator. So this, with this, I thank you. Thank you, Enrico. It's impressive to cover 131 <laughs> slides. In <minutes>. Sorry <laughs> but, about it. <laughs> but you actually had like two minutes left. So, I mean, <laughs> thanks a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do we have any questions? You can find me later uh, around in the, yeah. in, uh, in the exercise session if you have a curiosity, you want to elaborate more. So, you, you basically answered now the question why Walter was multiplying E square. To all his uh, fluxes, because this is the, uh, the standard for the prediction for yeah, the yeah. use of shock acceleration. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Ah, Walter. Yeah. There you are. Yeah. So thanks for the talk. We really understood, uh, I think, a lot which we didn't understand before. Um, so for the upstream and downstream escape and so on, and the geometry, we were a little bit confused at some point. So up, you are considering upstream escape only, right? So the observer has to be sitting upstream, which would be in your model uh, regarding uh, the forward shock. Uh, uh, you would be sitting upstream. Are you talking about the initial calculation or my model? That your model at the okay. end. I mean, so it will be like at the end. There was, as far as I understand, like upstream escape, which was like kind of delta shaped, which I also saw, I think, for GFB models in the past, like a global set out or so. They had this for relativistic shocks, assumed like a similar term. Uh, but is that there also something like a, a downstream escape in this kind of model? Or did you just neglect that? Or didn't you look into that? Or is it um, normally, do you think that there's nothing which could escape like downstream? Because for, for relativistic shocks, it would make a difference, right? Because you would throw the whole thing then, if you have a relativistically moving blob, let's say, later in the direction of the observer, so also downstream material would be visible. Well, first of all, in a, um, uh, besides pulsar winds, I'm not aware of uh, um, systems, uh, relativistic winds, uh, uh, not being jetted. So I'm not, uh, I'm not entirely sure uh, how well you can apply a stationary transport equation to a relativistic uh, uh, shock. So I think rather than considering a finite size or only a finite size, you need also to take into account uh, time dependence. And uh, that's one thing. Then in our model, we don't have escape upstream. This is why we can reach so high energy. So if you particles trying to escape out upstream are ending up on the other side of the wind bubble. So here we have only escaped through the downstream. So because you call this downstream, but it's, is it like, I mean, I thought it was upstream. The uh, this, at the, okay, let's now uh, not make confusion for all, everyone. So let's assume that this is a, forget about the source. This is a supernova remnant. The, this is an expanding wind, uh, wind. This is called reverse shock. This is the forward shock. Mm -hmm. Acceleration is happening at the forward shock and particles are escaping upstream. They are confined here due to streaming instabilities. They are exciting the magnetic field and 
This is the mechanism confining particles in supernova remnant. Now we are in a wind bubble. Wind bubble is totally different. We are, uh, the forward shock is rel very slow, late time. So here acceleration is basically relevant. The, uh, the relevant acceleration is taking place at the wind termination shock, which is not coming back because it is sustained by the ramp pressure okay. of the wind and it's basically stalled. And uh, here, particles are accelerating. And when they reach enough high energy, they are trying to diffuse against the wind, but they eventually will end up coming back to the wind termination shock. And the only way they can escape is through the downstream. So they need to traverse the whole shocked region to, to be able to escape from the system. So uh, at the very beginning, I solved the equation for a simple shock, but here is a more complex model where here we are having, if you want two shocks, one that is actually a strong shock, and this is, is just a discontinuity, it's not a strong shock. So here we don't have acceleration in mm. our wind bubble model. Okay. Any other question? Yeah. Uh, so I'm curious about your injection term. So the skew basically, uh, are you, what are you assuming for it in your, in your model? Is it uh, coming from a uniform density of, uh, of uh, potentially accelerable particles present in your medium or? So uh, let me go back to the mathematical expression so I can spend. Okay, here we are. So this is uh, always the, uh, when you uh, are assuming a fresh injection, it means that you are picking up particles from the thermal plasma and you are injecting them in the acceleration process. So you have a density uh, of particles in the medium, which is not constant. So the, um, the density uh, of a wind scales like m dot divided by r squared. So it's radial dependent in a spherical, uh, spherically expanding bubble. It's actually m dot 4 pi r squared u. This is the density, and this is uh, the number of particles arriving at each second at the shock. And this is the velocity they have. So this is a flux of particles. This is an efficiency factor telling you how many particles from out of this flux are actually injected, because not all of them, the majority of particles are just uh, background plasma. So this number is typically of the order of 10 to minus 5. And uh, so this is just a normalization factor. And, uh, and then we, uh, we are having that only particles above a certain energy that allows them to do the very first gyration is those that, that are injected. So, and this energy is on the high energy tail of the Maxwellian. This is why the delta approximation is a reasonable one. So this is the injection term that works both in the infinite planar shock I have discussed, but also in the in the spherically expanding with bubble. Okay. Hey, other questions? Also, other questions on Zoom, Maurizio? No? Ah, there was one. Hi. So, in this model for the AGN, do you predict that the cosmic rays will be emitted isotropically or is the like is the direction of the jet, for example, favor? The, that's a good question. So in principle, uh, um, AGN-driven winds are much more common than jets. So jets, and I'm talking about strong jets, uh, like um, uh, BLAC or flat mm -hmm. spectrum radio quasar. Those are actually, those are the most powerful um, uh, the most powerful AGN objects, and they are also the most common extragalactic objects observed by the Fermi lab. But in terms of total number of active galaxies, they are an absolute minority. So um, uh, this non-jetted activity like AGN driven winds are actually the most common. You observe it in Cipher galaxies, in um, um, uh, line AGN. So there are the majority of Active galaxies are uh, uh, characterized by 
these uh, these winds and uh, actually uh, these ultra fast outflow are not only observed in a, a radio quiet agn they are also observed in radio loud so there are some uh, theorists that are suggesting that you you can have both a jet and an ultra fast outflow that helps confining the jet uh, making it with a very small opening angle so uh, i'm not expert on this i cannot tell you a lot about it but uh, in uh, it seems that this fast uh, uh, ultra fast outflow winds are uh, quite ubiquitous in AGN and uh, we just observed a few dozen of them because uh, our x-ray telescopes are not good enough but uh, statistics uh, or over local samples of active galaxies indicate that they are uh, at least at 30 percent level in every active galaxy so I don't want to enter into the detail of jets but this uh, these winds can be present all also in addition to a jet then they would be two different accelerators making a, a very complex uh, system you might have acceleration both in the jet and in the wind itself but uh, yeah okay thanks okay uh, if there are no further questions on zoom or here let's uh, thank enrico again yeah.